Welcome back to Cosmic Comics. And welcome back, Violator. Spawn, Myths, Part 1 and 2, published in 1994. Story and Art by Todd McFarlane. Part 1, dedicated to Jim Salakrup. And Part 2 is dedicated to Martin Nodell. Editor and Letters, Tom Orzachowski. Color, Steve Olip and Oli Optics. Violator is in the process of bragging about how his boss would always call him in for the toughest assignments. We get a humorous turn of events when we see his audience. He's bragging about how rough and tough he is to a bunch of children. On top of that, they don't believe him. Violator lets their insults roll right off him, insisting that he's a part of history. Violator is going to honor these three souls with the unvarnished truth. But unfortunately, they'd much rather watch movies than listen to his stories. The kids are bored and ready to leave. Violator appears to be in some sort of bargain with the kids, where he lets them tell them about their heroes first. The kids could care less about the deal, giving the classic Bart Simpson line, Eat my shorts. For a moment, it seems as though Violator is going to kill the children, but decides he likes their bad attitudes. To get the kids to listen, he buys them off, passing them a fat wad of cash to listen to his tale. Violator takes us back 800 years to medieval Spawn. The way he tells the story is one of mixed perspective, where he paints Spawn as the villain. He begins his tale by calling medieval Spawn an evil wizard. He tells the kids medieval Spawn holds the people in check, using fear by gutting many innocents and staining his gear in their blood. It seems as though there could be some truth to his words until we turn the page. Violator insists that people fled before the sight of the Spawn, but the art paints a very different picture, with throngs of people celebrating Spawn as he rides by on horseback. Violator shares a story of this spawn standing by while a village is raped and pillaged, when in truth, he stood to defend it. The kids want to know why somebody didn't take out this bad dude. Violator brags, that's what his boss hired him to do. One of the kids rolls his eyes at Violator being 800 years old, but another tells him to shut up, signifying that Violator's story is catching some interest. Upon arrival, Violator killed all the villagers and ate their hearts. Violator didn't stop there. He went to the surrounding villages and killed them too. Once every soul was slaughtered, he waited for a hero to arrive. All the while, he continues to make himself out to be a noble knight protecting the townsfolk from an evil wizard. Violator tracks down the one man who knew where the spawn was headed, gets the information he needs, and then kills the man. The Violator advises that rushing into battle would weaken his position. It appears as though Heaven and Hell see eye to eye on some things. Heaven's Hunting Manual from Spawn issue number 9 also cautioned against rushing into battle against a Hellspawn. Violator hunts down the Hellspawn's mother. Before he can continue, the kids interrupt. Basically, they want to know how he could be 800 years old, who his boss is, and how could he have been employed for that long? Violator refers them back to the Bible. One of the children insistently assumes that Violator is a disciple, but Violator sets him straight, telling the kid to look in the other direction. Back at the 12th precinct, after two weeks of desk duty, Sam and Twitch have been cleared of any wrongdoing in the death of Billy Kincaid. Sam is so excited that somehow he allows a few donuts to go free when he tosses Twitch up into the air in excitement. The pair are also happy to score a victory over their nemesis, Chief Banks. First order of business for our two gumshoes is hunting down the man in the red cape. We check in on Spawn. It took him eight days to return from Africa to his chosen alleyway. This page goes into detail on the pecking order that is part of staking one's claim for a place to sleep at night in the alley. Spawn's chosen spot is undisputed. And once again we see Al being moody and broody, feeling sorry for himself. We get a necrometer reading of 7754. Instead of bemoaning a loss of power, this time Al is berating himself for allowing anger to dictate his actions. 
Al's biggest mistake? Now somebody knows he is alive. That kind of knowledge gives Chapel power. The branding he did to Chapel's face in the previous issue is permanent, and even makeup won't cover it up. And I'll also throw in at the end of that episode, I said that that was a Hellspawn chain that Chapel was holding up. It wasn't. It's just Chapel's personal symbol that he looks like now. Al feels better knowing he's not the only freak show. He decides against tracking Chapel down again. This sets things up for a future confrontation on Chapel's terms. Sam and Twitch have started their investigation into the red caped man at Rat City. These detectives are tracking down a murder suspect. Even young bloods aren't allowed to go around just killing people. Sam insists that if the wacko is smart, he would have left the city by now. Sam is surprised and delighted to find such a high density of homeless in the area. Sam almost gets off on the wrong foot with the alley's men until Twitch reins him in and reminds him to be pleasant. While Sam is asking about Mr. Red Cape, we can see Spawn standing off to the left side of the panel. All of the homeless deny seeing any such person. Al turns, deciding it's best to avoid confrontation. As he does so, Sam catches a glimpse of Spawn's cape disappearing around a corner. Before Sam can investigate, one of the men steps forward with a sudden and well-timed recollection. Sam sees through the distraction and continues on around the corner with Twitch, but Spawn is gone by the time the detectives arrive. We get a great one-page splash of Spawn on a building overlooking the city. The previous scene closes out with Sam commenting on Spawn living a charmed life. Both Al and the reader know how bad of a joke that is. Violator wants to tell the kids how he hunted down the evil wizard's wicked witch mother, but in reality it wasn't the Hell Spawn's mother. It was his lover, and of course she is a fair maiden, while Violator lies about how hideous, disgusting, and powerful she is. Or maybe it's just a matter of perspective. After leaving one day, Violator breaks into the Hellspawn's home and kills all the guards. He captures the maiden inside her cave after a battle. Violator claims the fight between him and the maiden was acclaimed for generations, and more importantly, he learned the wizard's location. Violator drags the maiden behind him to the coming battle. A challenge is sent out. A winner-take-all fight to the death between Violator and the Hellspawn. This era's Hellspawn accepts the challenge. That night, the two meet in battle. Violator moves to use the witch against the Spawn. She calls for help. Spawn tells Violator that he knows Violator was sent there to test him to see if he's fit for Hell's army. The battle goes on for a while, and hey, look, even the horse makes an appearance, kicking Violator off into the woods. Violator knows that the confrontation isn't over. The maiden is still tied to the tree, so he waits for the spawn to show himself, urging him to step forth into the moonlight. The hell spawn obliges. The Maiden watches as Violator opens his mouth and lets forth a stream of acidic flames onto the Hellspawn. Violator continues letting the flames pour on for ten minutes. The suit begins glowing red hot until the only thing left is... A bunch of interruptions and complaining from the kids. Violator has lost their interest and they are ready to take off and do something else. He offers them another $5 each to finish his story, and they accept. Inside the suit, he finds Diddly. The Spawn has been disintegrated. Spawn, Issue 15, Myths, Part 2 This issue starts off with a wall of text, Let's see if I can parse out any new information. Hell has been oddly silent of late, and Violator doesn't know what to do next. He's still stuck in his 3 foot 10 clown body and unable to transform into his more monstrous Violator form. In the meantime, he's building up his reputation and corrupting the youth. 
The three kids are Clint, Mark, and Spaz. We pick up where last issue left off with Violator breathing fire and roasting medieval Hellspawn in his suit of armor. The kids are still having a hard time believing that Violator is an 800-year-old fire-breathing stud who used to fight wizards and witches. Violator checks the remains of the suit for proof of the spawn's demise, but finds nothing, leaving him confident in his victory. Since he doesn't have anything left of the Hellspawn to take to his boss, he decides to take the head of the Maiden instead. As Violator approaches, she calls out to God for help. Violator asks her to continue. He hopes God is listening. He wants to make her suffer. Violator begins by slowly cutting her face, which makes the Maiden scream. And then, something chops off Violator's finger. Spawn's armor was burned, but the flesh was still intact. Spawn steps forward, sword in hand, and yeah, he's angry that his lover has been dragged into all of this. He calls Violator's creator a coward. A small side note tells us Spawn escaped the flames by teleporting out of his armor. Violator points out that they both have the same creator. This is the first time the Maiden has seen the scarred flesh beneath Spawn's armor. Violator repeatedly refers to the Maiden as Spawn's mother as part of the fictionalized version of events here, but now he says she is but a child, and admittedly, she looks rather young. Violator is swinging a tree like a baseball bat. Nice. As Spawn presses the attack, he screams about how she'll paint a picture of his victory tomorrow. Except as the battle rages on, she sees what her lover has become. Even though almost everything Violator says throughout the narration of this story is nothing but lies, he once again mentions that older Spawns will go to great lengths before expending any energy. In the heat of the battle, Spawn is disarmed of his sword. If Violator can get in close enough, he can finish the Hellspawn off with his flame. He just needs the Hellspawn to press the attack. Somehow, the Spawn ends up on Violator's head in what looks like a wrestling match. Spawn is exceptionally angry that the Violator ate the hearts of the children in the village. To be fair, he probably ate everybody's heart. Violator confesses that he prefers feasting on a nice, ripe, meaty adult's heart over that of a child. The bottom half of this page is important. Violator was tasked with seeing if this Hellspawn was worthy of being a leader in Hell's army. Violator looks forward to telling Melibolgia that he, Violator, is better qualified to lead Hell's army than some earthly newborn. This is a theme that will continue throughout the series. Violator is tasked with training, looking after, or testing the various Hellspawn over the ages. But Violator doesn't want to see them succeed. He doesn't want to see a Hellspawn leading Hell's armies. He thinks Hell's armies should be led by a native of Hell, preferably himself. For the second time, Violator roasts Spawn with his flames. This setup has always reminded me of Ghost and Goblins. You start out with armor, but if you get hit, you lose the armor, and if you get hit a second time, you die. Looks like this spawn might be in possession of an extra life. Violator appears to be at a loss as the cape and chains begin to wrap around and bind him. The spawn explains that he used a portion of his power to protect himself from the flames, and now he's using another portion of his power to create a replacement sword for the one he lost. Medieval spawn beheads Violator with the intention of sending him back to hell. We get this sweet shot of a shocked Violator's head flying through the air. As it bounces across the ground, we're told the battle is finally over. The Maiden is afraid the Hellspawn will hurt her. He explains that he revealed himself the way he did and took the actions he did to protect her. Spawn had hoped she would want him for who he was, see him for his true self. 
The maiden, once freed, runs away in terror, screaming for help, screaming for the monster to leave her alone. Spawn asks her not to do this. He begs her not to do this. She fled that day and spread her tale of terror from village to village. Over time, the story was changed and reshaped as legends are. Violator isn't certain why the color got changed to green, but he is the very first Western dragon. And for once, his boss was happy with his work, but not for the reasons Violator is letting on. We see Violator return to hell inside of a bubble. Melibolgia commends him for proving that this spawn has officer potential and destroying another's love for him. For this, Violator is made whole once more. The kids have had enough and are walking away. They call Violator a bozo and a loser as they leave. This is upsetting to a being who was once so feared he's known as the first dragon. As he's about to take after the kids, he's hit in the face with a newspaper which distracts him. Inside the paper, he reads about his murders of Mafia Don's crew and how Spawn is getting all of his credit. The paper has a quote from Kingpin Vito Gravano, who blames the murders on a costumed do-gooder. This is following Spawn and Vito's face-to-face -face meeting. Violator is upset that Vito is giving somebody else credit for his kills and makes plans to have his own face-to-face -face meeting with the Don. In the prior issue, a big deal was made about how Al always sleeps in the same spot and how for the homeless men of the alley, staking one's turf is an important ritual. Nobody messes with Al's spot. So it doesn't make much sense for Al to suddenly be sleeping on the back stoop of Mr. Nuno's restaurant? Maybe it has something to do with the fact that he isn't wearing his costume at the moment? Al is woken up by a muscular man complaining about the homeless stealing food scraps. Al tries to clear out, but the guy takes it the wrong way, thinking Al is talking down to him. In response, the tough guy throws a punch. As Al is getting beat up, he knows that he can't use his powers to get out of this. He needs to conserve them. Still, the guy continues his attack, hoping to break Al's nose. Al says he'd leave, but the muscle wants to see him leave in a body bag. Al gives some kind of weird homeless person battle cry and goes on the attack. He starts putting on the blows. Once the guy is on his back, Spawn pulls two boards off a nearby fence and slams one down on each side of the guy's head and explains he could have rammed him through his eyes if he wanted. Spawn asks the guy to leave once more, and he does so with a, Yes, sir. Al has grown weary of people constantly invading his turf. It's time to plant his flag. It's time to signal that this is Spawn territory. Awesome. And Al wants to do this without using his powers. Let's see how that works out for him, or how long it lasts. The issue ends checking in on Wanda and Terry. Wanda is sleeping, but Terry is on the phone. The person on the other end of the line is insisting that Terry has been messing with them. He's warned if they find anything incriminating that they'll be coming for him. They also let him know that they've been watching him and his family. They even know what his wife is wearing to bed each night. Once the people on the other line hang up, Terry is left sitting and sweating in silence. Okay, so the Fitzgerald storyline continues to creep along. It's great to see Violator reintroduced, and I think it's interesting that Todd found a way to build on his lore and reputation, letting us learn more about the character while not putting him into direct conflict with Spawn. If anything, this acts as foreshadowing to future conflicts between Spawn and Violator. It also reinforces that Violator has a lot more experience at this than Al Simmons. I also like how this issue takes the time to visit several different characters. This is something we will see a lot of early in the series. 
And let's be real, the big drop in this storyline is the history and introduction of another spawn. The fight in the back alley with Al at the end of part two feels a little out of place, especially when Al reacts in anger in order to decide his next move. In part one, Al said he needed to stop reacting to things out of anger, and here he goes again. These contradictions within the character are frustrating, but are eventually addressed within the series. In this case, we later find out that this is a typical pattern of behavior in young Hellspawn, and most likely has something to do with their disorientation and the bonding with their neural parasite. Next issue begins a, another storyline where Todd hands off the writing duties. Seriously, come on Todd, that was only four issues. Grant Morrison steps in to do a three-part story arc, Reflections. Also, next issue, Greg Capullo does his first art for Spawn. Handing off the art to Greg will prove to be a massive boon for the series over the long term as it allows Todd to focus on other matters. Hey, while you're here, go ahead and click that like button below. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel for um, more Spawn. Thanks for watching Cosmic Comics. I'm out.